Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 48 of 100. Today on the show, I have a very special guest, Giles Pearson, who you're probably more familiar with from his tenure at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, now turned startup co founder of Account Tests, based in Hawke's Bay, a cloud based accounting platform. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, their plans to grow internationally. Um, but first of all, great to have you on the show, Giles. Hi, Ryan. Yep, nice to be here. And so we're, we're actually at your old work now at PwC. This is where you used to spend a, a lot of your, your life. Um, you've recently left, is that right? That's, that's right. So, and it's slightly strange to be back here again. So this is, you're kind of in the middle of um, PwC life's now ending and you're moving towards account test. I think the first part we'll, we'll cover here and I think a lot of the audience will be interested in um, is your time at PwC. So you've really got some um, really deep skill set and experience uh, in business building value and, and managing risk for, for large businesses of uh, strategic value to Hawke's Bay. You know, over your, over your tenure of you know, since 98 through to now, um, what have you learnt about how businesses are run uh, in Hawke's Bay? So, look, I think the, maybe the first thing I'd say is um, accountants are not entrepreneurs. And so, so, that, so the value that your accountant brings to the business, I think a lot of people think accountants can help businesses make business decisions and entrepreneurial decisions and I guess and, and, and look to be fair a lot of accountants try to do that and some of them are, uh, some of them are good at it it's actually to my mind is not a core skill set of accountants because they tend to be process focused people and I think that's to be honest that's where accountants um, can add value and that's probably what I learned over my time here and you certainly uh, I guess you learn more uh, and as you gain experience, uh, like you do in any in any organisation, um, but I think I think what I really learnt was the was where we added the most value was where we helped these really entrepreneurial people to actually put some structure around the way that they ran their businesses and uh, just provide that focus and and you know a lot of people are not struggle with this concept but but the, the the sort of the monthly board meeting quarterly advisory board meeting call it what you like uh, that's where so much value is added to just keep people keeping people on track um, and despite the fact that you know look I, I guess I specialized in tax but we had a lot of clients who did all sorts of stuff and you know the accountant is probably in many cases, the only independent person who actually knows everything about the finances and what's going on in that business, because they're the only person that the owner is really willing to um, open up to. You've got this unique ability to add a whole lot of value, um, by, but not overstepping the mark on that, because you know in the end it's, it's expensive and people you know want to, don't want to pay their accountant masses amount of money, but at the same time, I think the structure that you can add to them for people, you know, the, the best entrepreneurs, to be honest, are all over the place. <laughs> um, and, and that's why they've succeeded in terms of coming up with ideas that other people haven't. You put a bit of structure around the way that they then make decisions, and suddenly you've got a winning formula. Um, right, so you're more, I guess, uh, used to having entrepreneurs coming to you saying, hey, this is my idea. And then you can put some procedures or processes and structure around how to execute on that idea or how to build the foundation so when that idea plays out, um, it's done in the most efficient structure or efficient way. Well, look, so I think there's, there's two parts to that. One is every business needs to have their finance part of their business in order and needs to have a little strategy around making sure that the financial aspects are dealt with. That's core core business for accountants, and you know, look, every accountant should be making sure that their clients uh, have that under control. Good management reporting, um, KPIs, you know, all, all of this stuff that um, you just need to know. And, and packages like Zero and NYOB are, are really helping in terms of being able to make that you know real time um, value. So that's 
So that's part of it. But and, and then I guess the step beyond that that some clients were willing to to let their accountant get involved in, or, or really needed their accountant to get involved in, is then actually helping them do. You know, have you got a strategic plan? Um, where, where's your business plan? Where, where, where's your where's your monthly meeting agendas where you're actually spending half your time on strategic issues? Uh, where you know where's the where's the action plans? Where's the accountability? Uh, that having somebody else helping you make sure that you stay on track um, and don't just chase what is today's good idea and forget about all the good ideas that you've had in the past. So just trying to you know put put that structure around. So that that's uh, I guess is the two parts I think where the the sort of generically accountants can add the most value and, and really people should be business owners should be looking for somebody who can do both parts of that. The accountant, absolutely the first part, doesn't have to be the accountant for the second part, but is you know a critical part of making sure that your business is gonna succeed. Now you would have seen over your period of time since, since 1998 business owners uh, who have adhered to that, who have put that rigor around, who have kept that uh, formal communication going within their business uh, and with trusted advisors, including the accountants. Um, how you know you've you've had enough time to see how that's then played out for those businesses mm. making decisions with or without rigor. Mm. Um, do you see any um, similarities across businesses in Hawke's Bay in terms of like a success formula? So it, 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 it's interesting. A number of our clients were family businesses, and the ones that that really succeeded was where you had. Um, often two people who had very complementary skill sets. So you'd have the entrepreneur and the um, more conservative process focused person. And those businesses, so effectively, you know, in terms of talking about how to make, how to, how to get that structure right, they had that structure right because they had those complementary skill sets already there in place. Those businesses, I think, almost invariably did did well where those family members were able to understand what their functions, each of their functions were, and they could, if you like, tolerate each other. Um, you know, keeping keeping that accountability in place. That was a that was a massively strong formula. Because um, that's always tough with family businesses, is to put the rigor around it yep. while still. Um, Acknowledging some of the internal politics within any family business, oh, look, and, 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 and yeah, that's right. And business doesn't disappear then because you because you you know you've got the whole family context of you know uh, stuff that families do together. Uh, so you know, look, it's not easy, but for those people who managed to get that to work, uh, you know, that that was a win winning formula. Um, I think for those family businesses that didn't have that, the ones that that I saw that did the best were the ones who then embraced uh, getting that skill set on board, whichever the, whichever part of it that they didn't have, which is I guess you know typically is the is the process. But getting that on board, whether that be um, using their accountant, using some other business mentor, business advisor, um, or actually having a proper board structure in place where they actually had you know at least one independent board member. Uh, and actually, were prepared to um, allow that person to keep them accountable. So there's no point in, in any of these scenarios in having this the, this independent person to help you if you then just go off and do whatever you want. Um, so so those who got that who got the the, the, the fact that that structure added value to them um, that was that was a winning formula. Um, now, over that period of time, uh, the larger you know, picture, the economy's gone through some, some very good ups and some downs. Is that approach to running a business more important in the growth times or the recession times? Um, ha you know, have you seen the differences through those times when rigor is applied to a business like that? Um, I think it's absolutely relevant the whole time um, because it is all about having a structure to make good decisions 
Um, look, off the top of my head, I'd probably say that in the growth times is actually where you can make the worst decisions because you're chasing opportunities. So, so, so the world's full of opportunities and you're chasing them. If you, if you choose the wrong ones or, or execute badly or overreach, you know, that, that when the down times come, that's going to hit you really hard. That makes um, sense because in down times you can manage your costs and you know all the knowns, whereas in boom times if you've, you can if, get if you've, right off if track. You've, if you've, you know, look, and we saw quite a number of this, if you've gone off and set up your business in the US or China or Australia and actually you're not ready and you haven't got the capital behind you or, or you know, you haven't anticipated how hard it's going to be to make progress in those markets because it's always more difficult than people anticipate then suddenly there's a there's a bottomless pit of cash that you've got that, that, that you you find you know you're you're financing your US operation um, which maybe isn't making the headway that you expected suddenly in the bad times that turns out to be a you know a, a disaster um, it must make for some uh, challenging conversations because with the entrepreneurial mindset, you'll have someone saying, yeah, it's a, it's a big reach, but I think we can do it. Uh, and that's when you see everything growing around you, you yep. want to make those decisions. Yep. Um, so I guess that's the, what would be your advice for business owners now? Because we are in one of those growth times. Hmm. What should they be, be looking well, at? Well, ha- having that, having that, uh, having that independent person to help them through that. But Look, I guess my experience has probably been talk to as many people as you possibly can um, and spend as much time talking to, uh, talking to customers in those markets and talking to other people who've been there and done it. And, you know, my experience would be that people are, uh, you know, as long as they're not absolutely directly competing with you, people are really happy to help and really happy to share their experiences and you know how they went about doing something and what they you know what they found giving you introductions to people who helped them um, you know trying to go out and do it on your own without that uh, is, is not a recipe for for make you know a, a successful outcome that's smart advice because there are a lot you know all business owners we've got scars on our backs from where we've done something wrong we're more than happy to steer someone away from that mm. uh, and that can you know why learn on your own when you can learn from someone else's um, and state. Kiwis are really are really sharing yeah. you know because we're any business that that's uh, is a Kiwi business that's gone offshore it's always you know you, you, you really are going into a way bigger market than you've ever dealt with um, and I think there's a, there's a strong collegiality of New Zealand businesses. You know, you're not competing with your neighbour down the road, you're competing with the world when you're out there. And, uh, you know, people appreciate the fact that, you know, we, we're, we as Kiwis are all in this together. Certainly for the export side of things, and you must have seen some massive changes in where we've exported too, given the, um, I think the growth in, into China has been about 10 billion in exports since early 2000s. Uh, how much of that is, is Hawke's Bay businesses getting? Um, oh, look, the, I think the, the, what I saw, as you say, was a, was a, a big shift in, um, in, in where, where product was going. So a lot of the businesses around here are agriculturally focused, and it's all around produce. So whether that be apples, whether that be meat, whether that be wine, um, whether that be crops, you know, they're, they're all, certainly in 1998, uh, most of that product was going to Europe, uh, maybe with a bit to North America. I think that's, that's swung and is continuing to swing heavily towards Asia, more towards North America and certainly less towards Europe. Um, and I guess typically what, what I think, the you know, look, looking back on it, people's approach to Asia has been much more about uh, working with distributors in those markets and I, I guess the Asian, the, the, the Asian experience is uh, that people on the ground in Asia do a lot better than 
we will try and do in those markets. Find somebody you trust uh, and then let them do that and don't try and necessarily get in market uh, in the same way that certainly, say, in North America, um, I think that, that that's been a tougher strategy but was one that you can succeed in is getting in market and having your people in market. That, that from what I saw across a whole range of um, Hawke's Bay businesses, wasn't what people were trying to do in Asia and that, that seemed to work better. So um, we're let, let, in Asia, let them do the last mile culturally uh, and just find somebody you trust to own that market space correct. on your behalf. And the, and the Asian business model and the Asian way of make of, of decision making is quite different to ours. And I think, you know, people have have uh, had some surprises just just in the way that um, the way that we expect business to be done is not vastly different to North America and Europe. Very different in Asia, and and you know, and we. People might say, "Oh, that's unfair or unethical, or that's not the way you should do things." Well, that's just the way. That, that's just not the way that we do things. Right. The, um, the market's the market. But but don't fight that. Deal with somebody who who, who can then go in market and, and and negotiate those deals in the way that makes sense in that market. That's smart advice. So just have be eyes open and deal with the realities rather than yeah. trying to change the culture. Yeah. Um, now, you're not with PwC anymore, but that's some great insight for, for those listening uh, who are running their own businesses. Now, you've stepped onto the other side of the fence, so you've gone from the big enterprise doing the consulting. Now, you are the, the co-founder on the startup side yep. of things. How many of, of those lessons that you've been you know, advising <laughs> others have you now you know, taken on board yourself? <laughs> Certainly, trying to do as much of that as I can. Look, and we've you talk about the scars on your back, and we've already we've already had those and learned some tough lessons by not not doing the things that I've just been talking about. Um, and I guess it's interesting seeing it from the other side. Look, you 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 try and to spend as little money as possible, uh, and you know trying to get the business to go as fast as you can, and. It's very easy just just to chase the next opportunity, chase the next email inquiry that you've had, um, and lose focus on on the big picture. Um, so, look, we're not doing it perfectly by any means, but we we do understand, I think, what we should be doing, and we're trying to do as as much of that as um, as possible. So. Uh, my my lesson to myself would be is actually go back and and, and think about what I've just said ten minutes ago and, um, and, and you know and try and keep as much of that um, in your head as you can. So let's let's talk about the actual account test business itself uh, and how that has come about. Uh, so what was the opportunity or what was the the gap in the market that you believed um, that you could fill and that there was an opportunity mm-hmm. there to solve for. Um, for businesses out there? So I guess going back about five years, one of the frustrations that I had, both within PwC but also looking at, uh, at our clients who were trying to hire accountants was, you know, in a, in a, a good recruiting model, um, you know, you use a strong interview process, you then using a, a testing process which would typically involve um, psych testing and ability testing, so that's numerical and verbal reasoning testing, and then doing what you'd call technical competency or work skills testing to see whether the employee that you're looking to hire has got all the things that you need. And and in the accounting context, um, you can do the psych testing and the ability testing, but the the, the technical competency testing you know, is, is it has always been either non-existent or just ad hoc. So, um, it, different employers having little tests or, or, you know, having a set of accounts that they ask people to look at and then come into an interview and uh, and, and respond to questions about or or whatever. And some of that's some of that's not too bad, but it's it is all very ad hoc, um, and there's nothing that you can very difficult to then compare candidates against each other, particularly if you try and do it at a distance. So. I got personally pretty frustrated with that. I had some conversations with Steve Evans, um, who I'm now in business with. So he, his background is in testing and assessment uh, out of the UK, 
and we asked him, or PwC asked him to go away and have a look and see what he could find in terms of technical competency testing for accountants, and the answer was, you know, in New Zealand and Australia there was nothing, in the UK a little bit, um, in the US, uh, and these are all online products, in the US th there are some uh, testing products that are available there, mostly to our mind, weren't that great. Um, not country specific, certainly other other than to the US, uh, and most of the questions were pretty sort of just textbook questions, um, and so certainly not appropriate for the sort of people that you know a New Zealand business would be trying to take on. So I guess uh, after a few conversations, um, you know, we decided we'd see what we could do about that. Um, probably not anticipating quite where that might end up, but. Uh, so Steve sort of picked up the ball on that and, and ran with it um, whilst I was at PwC and I was helping out in the background and then you know when I finished in June um, so I've been hitting the road uh, with Steve since since 30 June this year. It's kind of surprising that that didn't exist in the marketplace given just our, our conversation around your time at PwC um, and how important that role can be. Uh, it's surprising that, you know, that there's the psych tests, there's the interviews, but there's not any indication of can the person do management accounting, for example, or bookkeeping, because there must be lots of different flavours of, of accountants. Uh, how do you know you're getting the right one for the position you've got or the project you've got? Mm. Oh, look, and, and that's, that's exactly right. And I guess, um, to be fair, you look across all the professions and there wouldn't be any technical competency testing um, across across most of those in terms of bringing on staff. And, and I guess you know, you know some people would say, well, if they've got a if they've got their chartered accountants ticket, then you know clearly they are at a level which means you know they can do all of these things. And I, and I think the reality is is like in any job, you you've got a bell curve of. Of abilities, and some people are, are really fantastic. Others are really quite mediocre, and you get a whole lot of people in the middle. Um, Does this test tell you where on the bell curve? So, so that's so that's what we tried to do. So, so what we've developed is a, I guess, a series of tests. Um, so you've got a chartered accountant test. So that's for positions where uh, the job description says this person needs to be a chartered accountant. We've got a qualified by experience test which is for positions that say you know this is an account of a position for an accountant don't need to be qualified uh, and then we've got a bookkeeper test for businesses that you know want to hire an office manager say and part of their job is to is to do the books and use zero or my or something like that um, do the GST and all those sorts of things uh, or for a business that wants to hire a bookkeeper to come in you know 10 hours a week or whatever to, to help them out um, so those tests cover, they're, they're sort of generalist tests, so they're New Zealand specific, um, covering financial accounting, management accounting, costing and tax, uh, and then on the side we've built a management accounting test and a cost accounting test as separate tests for, for the industry, you know, essentially the corporate market where it may well be they don't need a role, you know, they've got a role that, that requires a lot of tax or financial accounting be done it's mostly internal reporting so you know those are more uh, appropriate and then we've replicated that suite of tests for the UK and the Australian market as well. Right so with your testing you can find the exactly the right set of skills for the position you've got going and see how competent they are at those skills across New Zealand, UK and Australia which is New Zealand UK. So Australia is just about to go up uh, on the website now and this is all cloud-based, so it doesn't matter where a business owner is located, they can get these tests purchased, I assume, um, for... Do you, do you do this at the candidate stage, or is this for existing uh, employees, benchmarking? Like, how is it being used so far? So far, most people are using it on final stage candidates, so uh, sometimes just on the preferred candidate, sometimes on uh, maybe the last two or three. Uh, look, we didn't know how this was going to play out. Um, no one has so far used it for internal benchmarking. Um, 
There is possibility, and we have had discussions with people for using it in where, where there's a restructuring going on, and, and there's going to be some redundancies. Um, you know, the, the, you could use this as part of a process to determine who's going to stay and who's going to go. That's pretty scary. Um, but to be fair, there needs to be a process, and at least this is an objective way of um, looking at that. Uh, so, so you know, look, it's it's mostly at that final um, final stages of an employment process, and it's you know, look at it. To be fair, you've got to look at what we're doing in the context of all the other parts of that uh, process of taking people on board. It's a 30-minute test. It gives you a snapshot of their skills. Uh, if they've done fantastically uh, on that, you know, it may well be you go, gee, we've really found uh, a good person here. The market's tight, which it, which it mostly is. Let's get on the phone and get that person on board now before somebody else works out that they're actually good. Um, That's quite a smart yeah. way to use it, to kind of laser focus down on the best person for the job before yeah. anyone else can, you know, before you have to compete either with salary or rewards or, or potentially lose the person. Oh, look, and we had an example last week where um, somebody went for two jobs, uh, one of, and, and this is in a regional um CA firm market. Uh, one of those CA firms tested this person and the other one didn't. Uh, the one who tested them said they've got the skills we need. You know, they're, 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 not, a, they're not a superstar, but they're, they're going to fit um, technically with what we want. And they just did the deal then and there. And, uh, and the other people missed out because, you know, they didn't have that much information. So they were, you know, just slower to make a decision. I guess if you've got more of that data, if it reveals more about the candidate, you can be more confident quicker without having to you know, put everyone down a, um, down a process of elimination because you can see straight away from the test. Well, that's right. And look, and that's, that's technical uh, competency, you know, how do they fit with the team and, and, and whatever. Well, that's, that's other stuff. And, and, uh, so, so look, it's just part of that. But, but the flip side is... Uh, and look, we've we've certainly seen uh, experiences that 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 companies have had. So there was another one um, a, a three or four weeks ago where, you know, this this guy came in. He his CV was good. He interviewed strongly. You know, was the preferred candidate. Uh, was saying to them, um, look, I've got other offers. Uh, so can you make your mind up quickly? And they were just, I guess, a little hesitant. Um, so they decided to put him through the test, uh, and he scored on the 12th percentile. So that meant that 88 out of 100 chartered accountants in New Zealand are better than him. Wow! Um, so he wasn't he was not a star performer by any means. Um, he was uh, a pretty poor performer. What would it cost um, a business to make a mistake in hiring someone like that? That they realise it's a six months down the track. Yeah. Is, so, it, is it the cost of the wage, or are there other potential flow-on consequences by you know, bad accounting being done? Well, just just the, the so the research would tell you the cost is 143 percent of their salary package. Um, so that 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 won't that won't cover the, uh, the 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 mistakes that they've made and the and the decision the, the maybe the poor decisions that the business has made as a result of having the wrong information, but it covers the cost of you know all the other things that go along with having a poor employee, um, and then the costs of trying to exit them from the business or do whatever you need to do. And um, how much is the test? Uh, so so the the basic cost two hundred bucks. You that's know, cheap insurance. So, so for two hundred bucks, you get you, exactly. That's what you. Would, so, so if your candidate turns out to be about what you thought they were, you know, you could say, well, you know, have you just wasted your money? Uh, and I think the answer is no, because you've what you've actually done is validated the the decision. But if it, but if that again, if that helps you to make a decision quickly, then you can get onto them, get them on board. Um, this particular guy, you know, look, the the uh, the employer had a couple of options. They could just go, see you later, not taking this any yeah. further. Or they could go, actually, you, you, you tick a lot of other bo boxes, but uh, look, we need a reference, do our reference checking much more carefully than we might otherwise have done, and we need to talk to your current um, 
your current manager and you know ask some really pointed questions around your technical ability uh, and we need to put some support around you on day one maybe we need to send you on some training or, or get you encourage you to do some some further learning to, to get your skills up but you know that on the first day they walk into the office and not on the hundred and first day um, that's a, you know that's a big advantage you're getting to validate uh, your assumptions about the candidate anyway mitigate your risk and um, reduce that um, speed to market of giving someone a, a um, job offer yeah yeah I don't see why you wouldn't do it for two hundred dollars versus the potential downside if you hire for the you mm. know, the wrong type of person and I guess they're already doing these types of tests just on the psychometric side. Um, is this something that uh, the, the business owners are going to be doing, or is it the large CA firms that are going to be adopting this process, or both? Well, look, arguably, it, for any position anywhere, you know, if you follow a good process, you would be doing technical competency testing. The reality is, um, most SMEs in New Zealand don't follow good processes. Um, and you know the the, the old uh, rule of um, you, you make your decision within seven seconds of them walking in the door uh, pretty much applies. So so what we're we're concentrating our efforts on is organisations that do use good process and uh, and will already be using other testing products. You know it's unlikely that people are going to pick up using this if they're not doing any other testing at the moment because they clearly don't have a mindset of. Um, of doing that but again the research tells you that the correlation between somebody working out for you in the role and doing a good process is is high um, so and, and the more the more good processes you add into to your hiring um, structure the higher the correlation is with the with the, the person working out in role so you know you, you again you, you know you, you spend the money and you um, and you get the answer, but most people don't. Um, so yeah, so we're concentrating on uh, on the bigger accounting firms, uh, the the some of the recruiting firms uh, who are you know are keen to to add this into their processes, and some of the corporates and government. Um, it just sounds like a smart competitive advantage to have uh, in the marketplace if you're always hiring for those types of accounting roles. Uh, looking at the bigger picture, you know, there's a lot of um, transformation going on in accounting, uh, led by Zero. There's also what MYOB is doing. Um, does that play into you know where you sit? And the, when there's a, a lot of transformation going on in an industry, there is lots of job changes going on. Is this going to um, is this going to help where Zero and MYOB is going? Or is it kind of agnostic to all of that because it's core accounting skills? I think everybody's uh, everybody who's working in that SME market. So this is principally the, uh, the the accounting firms is being significantly impacted by zero and MYOB. So they're coming in and eating the lunch at that sort of financial accounting end, doing the books, um, producing year end sets of accounts and management accounts and all that stuff. So so they're coming in and, and de dealing with a lot of that stuff. So the challenge for the accounting professionals to keep themselves relevant and I think it's pretty obvious out there that you know a lot of a lot of firms are um, focusing much more on the advisory side and you know um, how they can help businesses um, use the information they've got to make to make better decisions so from our perspective I think there's probably two aspects for um, for those younger candidates who haven't come through the traditional um, factory of compliance and, and doing the books, um, there is still no substitute for having a strong understanding of what the computer is doing. So when Xero is processing transactions, if you don't understand what it's trying to do in the background, then you're going to struggle to, when things are not, you know, when the information's not right, you won't know how to go and look for that. So, so I think there's that part of it is actually for those young people is testing whether they still have those core technical double entry bookkeeping skills. Do they know what's going on? Um, for I think everybody across the CA market, the skills you can sell to clients now are the management accounting skills. So how do you get value out of the information that, that is being produced? How do you configure the information 
in a way that produces stuff that you can make good decisions from. Uh, you know, business owners can have all this information, but if they don't understand what it's telling them and what they what they can then do about it, um, you know, that's the bit accountants can add value. But that's the bit that a lot of uh, CA firms struggle with because they've got a whole lot of people who spend their life who have spent their lives doing compliance and doing the books. Yeah. Um, so the so the testing in that sort of management and costing area will tell you whether your candidate's got. Um, got the skills to do those advisory bits as well as doing the compliance uh, and certainly we've had people who are now looking to use our tests to benchmark staff not as a, you know and this is this is not this is not as part of a uh, just as a training exercise if you like so so just to go hey look we we're, we we want to just look at where everybody's at because actually what we think we're going to find is from junior to partner we don't have the skills so here's a way of just almost just demonstrating to ourselves we don't have the skills now we need to go away and, and help help our staff um, lift, the, lift that skill base because that's what we can now sell so our tests I guess are, if you're bringing somebody on are helping to uh, see whether you know see whether your candidate has got those skills already. Now you've launched this already in New Zealand. Yep. Uh, and you're not mucking around there. I bumped into Steve earlier this morning at the, the coffee shop, and he said that um, there's a deal on the table, or it may have been done in the UK. So, um, in terms of marketing account tests, is this a um, you know what Rodri would say is you know global from day one, or um, <laughs> this, this comes back to the discussion we had about good process. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, look, we we built we built New Zealand. We then, without really having validated the New Zealand market, we built the UK, and without having really validated either New Zealand or the UK, we built the Australian. This is true suite. entrepreneurial, um, <laughs> and it's sort of on a and I build it and they will come philosophy. And look, at now we're realizing that we we thought we could market this over the web. And we have tried that, and people don't know that what we're doing even exists, um, so they're not looking for it. So you, you you don't get any Google searches looking for comp accounting competency tests. Um, you get people looking for tests, but that's usually candidates um, looking for help to get a job, but that's not that, that's not our market. So um, so what we've realised is we need to educate the market. Um, which is a much longer term mm -hmm. game. So uh, in New Zealand, the only way we've been able to do that is to go knocking on doors um, and using good good sales techniques um, uh, around, um, I guess, using you know, um, uh, getting getting warm introductions to people in whatever way we can and uh, just going and talking to them about what we do. Oh, look, and when we when we do that, we get a fabulous response. Um, but we're educating people one by one across the table at the moment, and that's that's uh, hard work and slow. So um, we've Steve's made one sales trip to the UK, out of which look we we have this uh, opportunity, which is now come to play um, six months after he was there. Um, so that's look that's that's uh, great and and you know look is the biggest opportunity we've we've got anywhere but um, what we're trying to do now is learn how to go to market in New Zealand because that will dictate how we go to market in the UK and Australia um, I think having those conversations you get to hone your pitch refine it also yeah. hear the feedback each time you do it and that helps you build a, a bigger picture of the marketplace. So then when you put that into code or you update your tests or your, your site, you know you're updating it for an audience that you've met and you can you know, in the, and you can actually go back in your mind thinking, oh, that's what I learned from that meeting. All this market week. research that we could have done before we started, <laughs> but we're actually doing it now, the product's already in market, and, and I'm sure that's never been done before. <laughs> I'm sure it never has been done. I, I think um, there's, a, there's a, a way that they, they launch products in the US where they'll just launch the idea, the concept of it, and see if it gets any traction. If it does get some, great, they'll, they'll carry on down that route. 
Um, and if it doesn't, they'll either then do the, the heavy lifting of going to meet people. Um, I think for you know, your type of business, the partnership is going to be quite important, having some, some key partners, uh, because that will help you, you know, gain that credibility for a, what is a new brand and a new concept, uh, and hopefully shortcut that you know, educating a whole marketplace, because that can be yeah. time-consuming and hard to know what is good time spent versus yeah. waste of time spent. Yeah, and I think what, you know, look, and this is, this is the same for, for any business doing something similar to us, is we just, we, we need to be credentialised, and that means getting on board four or five key iconic names who become advocates for us, and you just drop those names into a conversation, and you, you've speeded things up immensely. Yep, that's a really smart way for, for any business is, um, I call it the ladder approach, where you may get a couple of small ones early on, and small as in small of benefit to you or small in their marketplace. Uh, but you can build on those ones to get to the next level up and next level until you get to the, the top of the ladder, whatever that is for your industry. Um, and I think you know once you get one of those in the UK in particular, I mean, the, the size of the market there, and particularly the amount of accounting that happens in the square mile, uh, you only need a couple of those to be doing very well indeed for a cloud-based service. Mm-hmm. So look, we, we are hoping that we can, we can still go to market uh, online um, or at a distance, um, even if it's not all online. Uh, the jury's still out on that because of, because we need to get the New Zealand, we need to get runs on the board in New Zealand and then see what we can do with those at a distance from the UK. Do we need to get a UK distributor that effectively replicates what Steve and I are doing in New Zealand to actually get in their car and go around and, and, and meet people? We don't know yet. Um, we're not far away from having to make a decision around That's that. That's the uh, exciting part of running your own business yeah. is you, you get to make these choices. But, you know, the flip side is, does Steve and I want to go and spend six months in the UK knocking on doors? Probably not. Uh, that's not what we that's not what we set this thing up to do. Uh, don't mind making a few trips, but, you know, Hawke's Bay is a better place to hang around in than... Uh, I was going to say, know, like... Um, Sheffield you know, or... Um, yeah, like outside of business... Um, were you not tempted at the end of the PwC um, side of things just to, to you know, hang up your coat and say, oh, you know, I'm done? Mm. Well, look, so I didn't leave PwC to, to do this. Um, I, I guess I had already decided that I was going to go, um, you know, five years ago. That it, it was already, uh, I, I'd worked out when the kids left school, you know, this was time to... Uh, have some have some more free time and, and do some other things. So so you know this has all come together. I guess at a convenient uh, time maybe. Um, but you know look, I, I'm ingen- energised by it. Um, and can you sit at home and do nothing? Or you know look, I, I, I guess uh, my thought had been I was going to. Uh, do a few Ironmans and, and run some ultra marathons and, you know, just spend my time doing that. Uh, and I am getting to do some of that, not the the, the ultra marathons, yes, the Ironmans, no, because I haven't got the time to do the training. But um, but it's about just trying to create, create that balance and I guess it, um, I'm determined to make sure that I get out of leaving PwC the key, the key things that I was trying to do which was get more time to do you know just to do other stuff read a book even scarily um, excellent I'm glad that you've you've uh, got that rebalance now and uh, I'm excited to see you know, where account test goes I think um, any marketplace that's transforming as fast uh, as what accounting is doing at the moment um, is always going to be an exciting place to be in um, and I think to have spotted the opportunity and and then within your own business taken some of your own advice and you know found Steve and with complementary skills um, I think um, you'll be um, you're well set up and I think with any business to be able to um, identify where you've got something wrong and be able to switch or pivot around um, I think that's one of the, the best skills to have um, is to you know it's easy to fool yourself um, so yeah look good luck into the UK 
and um, I look forward to hearing more about Accounts Test throughout 2017. Mm, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Giles. Cheers. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.